Could you tell me your name and title, please? Professor Linda Richards. I am the Chair of the Department of Neuroscience at Washington University in St. Louis at the Medical School. Tell me about the hats you wear in the corpus callosum disorder space and the piece of the puzzle you're trying to solve. So I've been involved with OSDOC since early, probably two 2014 and I'm uh, one of the scientific advisors and I'm also the patron of OSDOC. Um, I'm a scientist and I'm really keen to try to understand how the corpus callosum forms and also what the corpus callosum actually does. What does it do? What do we know? So it's uh, the largest fibre tract in the brain and uh, it connects the two hemispheres together. It is involved in integrating information between the two sides of the brain. Um, but it also seems to do so much more than that. It actually connects all areas of the cerebral cortex. And we are learning so much about the different activity patterns that actually occur, you know, in different brain states throughout the day, in sleep, and in wake, wakeful times. And um, the corpus callosum may actually have some role in maintaining certain activity patterns within the brain. And we're learning a lot about how these activity patterns might encode information and help process all the different types of information that are coming into the brain. So um, at the moment, it's still uh, quite a mystery as to all of the things that the corpus callosum is responsible for. Um, and, you know, that that's really my work. That's what I work on. Another lifetime's work ahead, isn't it? Yes, so I, absolutely. I There's such a broad spectrum and, you know, it can be a, a partial agenesis, a complete agenesis. How does that affect people in different ways? Interestingly, um, people with partial and complete agenesis can actually have very similar cognitive outcomes, which is interesting because um, the, obviously that's an example where the brain is slightly wired differently because you have some fibers crossing in people with partial agenesis and no fibers crossing people with complete agenesis. And yet the same difficulties that those people face, there are some similarities in those difficulties, but across the whole group, there is quite a lot of heterogeneity as well, but it doesn't seem to segregate into partial and complete agenesis. So one thing that we are interested in understanding is whether there's a threshold amount of connectivity between the two hemispheres, that once you get below a certain amount of connectivity, then you have these um, different cognitive problems that uh, some people with corpus callosum disorders experience. Your research is focused on development, plasticity, the function of long-range connections in the cerebral cortex. What have been your biggest discoveries and that of your team so far? So when um, I first started studying the corpus callosum in 1997, um, I was really very focused on how the neurons in one hemisphere actually grow to the midline what are the mechanisms that um, guide them across the midline and then into the other hemisphere to find the right connection? And I am still working on this, but probably one of the biggest areas that uh, my lab has um, been involved in is discovering um, cells within the middle of the brain that actually form the bridge that allows the callosal axons to, to grow across. So we have described these cells in detail and the molecules that they express. So here we can link these to then the genetic conditions that people with corpus callosum disorders have. 
So um, these genes, there are over 400 different genes involved in forming a corpus callosum that we know of. And each of them, of course, has different functions. And we're trying to, you know, look at what, what are the different functions of those genes. So um, at the moment, our group is really focused on looking at those genes, how they might segregate into different pathways, and then how those genes actually um, impact the cellular organisation of the brain that has to occur in the second trimester in order for the corpus callosum to form. If we know that, what could, what, um, what's the value in that? What could we one day do about that potentially? I think the value in it is to really understand um, the condition in a, in a deep way. So um, we, we can then look at um, perhaps, although we won't be able to ever grow, regrow a corpus callosum, these genes frequently do other things in the body. And um, many of them are expressed at the midline. And so there are other conditions throughout the body that can occur. And if we understand that, you know, maybe they're also involved in epilepsy or in autism, um, it, it may be possible to identify drugs that um, may be able to help with some of the symptoms of corpus callosum disorders that people experience. But the other area uh, of our work that we're really um, pushing ahead with at the moment is to try to understand how after the corpus callosum axons cross the midline, how do they find the right place in the other hemisphere to make their connections? And this is an area that I'm really fascinated by. And we're studying the different patterns of activity that occur in different areas of the cerebral cortex. So um, corpus callosum neurons in one part of the brain tend to track across and innovate the same area in the other hemisphere. So how is it that they know to go to grow there and not to the place next door. A hypothesis that we're testing is that there may be different activity patterns that, that can do this. Now, this has real implications, not only for understanding corpus callosum disorders, but some other cognitive um, conditions like autism and ADHD, which are sometimes also associated with corpus callosum disorders, um, in that, Perhaps those conditions are also affected by how colossal axons are tracking in the, in the other hemisphere. So you can imagine if the brain is not wired up in the same way, maybe those you know, thought processes, the um, anxiety conditions and things like that might be affected. And is there potential if you understand how they make the right or the right connection or a healthy connection perhaps, is there the potential one day perhaps to stop them making an unhealthy connection or connect, you know, um, innovating in the wrong spot? So I wouldn't call them healthy or unhealthy. I think the one thing that we do understand is that the brain is incredibly plastic and that um, so there are there are wiring issues but there's also cognitive, the cognitive aspects. So can you get the same cognitive outcome from a differently wired brain? And the evidence currently is that you can for many aspects of, of cognition. And so uh, when we're talking about plasticity, I think that there's a lot more therapeutic potential in talking about sort of cognitive plasticity as opposed to structural changes, which may not actually be required to, to have these changes in perhaps like the pattern of activity that, you know, underlies the cognitive functions of the brain. Yes, that's interesting. Yeah. The, the, what's left to still be uncovered and the holy grail, what is it for you? The holy grail for me is really to understand how the brain is able to do all these functions without a corpus callosum 
and um, and the incredible plasticity both in the structural and in the cognitive plasticity that the brain is capable of. Trying to sort of document that in a scientific way so that we understand it's not a mystery, you know, so that we can really understand those processes. And um, it's really the first step in, this is where I kind of concentrate my work, the first step in being able to develop new therapies and um, ways of perhaps treating symptoms um, is really first to understand how those arise and what is the basis of them. And, and small animal models are a big part in, in, in your lab's work. Yes. What can we learn from animal studies that could help um, adults, children with a, with a CCD? So in, um, we use animals in our research because we want to be able to um, study in a very deep way, for example, some of the genetic changes that occur in people with corpus callosum disorders. So without studying animals where we can make that genetic mutation in the, in the animal model and then um, uh, understand how that gene functions, we we have no other way of doing doing this kind of work. You know, animals are a huge part of our research, and um, have allowed us to really make these breakthroughs in in understanding these disorders. What, what's exciting you in this field at the moment? What's what's coming up that you're excited about? Uh, we're very excited about some of our new experiments, um, working with uh, people with corpus callosum disorders using our virtual reality technology um, and uh, using this to be able to present different stimuli in different ways and try to pick apart some of these. So we talk about these cognitive functions. We want to drill down to understand the aspects that go into things like executive functions um, and um, understanding how uh, people think about different processing that they're trying to do with, with regards to problem solving or decision making. And we want to really try to understand how the brain is, the brain activity relates to the connectivity and that relates to the, the cognitive outcome. What do you hope your professional legacy will be in this space? Well, Hopefully I'm not quite at the legacy point yet, but in um, I think it, our work is really trying to understand the basis of these um, group of disorders. And um, if we can have some impact in understanding how they occur, how they affect people, and um, being an advocate for those people that have corpus callosum disorders, that would be a great thing for, to have achieved, I think. Um, thank you for joining us, Linda. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>